My name is Jason Leventhal. I'm from Burlington, Vermont. I own a ski company called J, just the letter J like you see on my hat. And for the past 20 years, I've been in the ski industry, so I'm going to tell you my story. Um, as a kid, I was extremely passionate about skiing. There was nothing I loved more, and this was the type of ski that I was on at that time. This is what everyone rode back in the day. This ski was actually designed for racing, and that was the only ski option you had at that time, whether you're in the powder or the moguls or all over the hill. This was what everyone was using, and it really, the design itself hadn't changed in over 100 years. I mean, the materials did, but not the way it was used, not, not the way it performed. Until in the mid-80s, snowboarding came around. Guys like Jake Burton, Tom Sims, Chuck Barfoot, they weren't interested in skiing on the hill. They wanted something more like a skateboard on the hill. So they designed this snowboard, which is more twin tip. So there's a tip on both ends, so you can ride it forwards and backwards. You can do all kinds of tricks, just like a skateboard, unlike a ski. It had deep side cuts, so you can easily carve turns, unlike a ski. It was wider, so it would float in the powder really easily, uh, much easier than a ski. And it was really small and, and easy to spin, really nimble. So you can see here in this photo, you could do tricks, you could flips kind of stuff that you'd see in action sports today. So if you're a kid at that time and you look at a guy in a spandex suit turning around a pole, or you see this image of people doing spins and tricks and all kinds of things like you'd see in skateboarding and action sports in the X Games, which would you choose? Obviously, you're gonna choose snowboarding and that's what was happening. So snowboarding was exponentially growing at that time when I was a kid. Skiing was on the decline, but I'm talking about someone, say, under age 25. So here I am, one of those kids, and I want to go snowboarding too. So here's me and my friends in high school. I lived in Albany, New York. We went to Stratton. I'm the guy right above that white tip of the Tim Sw Sim switchblade snowboard. And uh, so we'd go to Stratton Mountain from Albany, New York, and on the way there'd be the Burton factory in Manchester, Vermont. And we'd stop and we'd check out the boards, and there was a constant evolution, a lot of energy and excitement around snowboarding. Uh, that really didn't exist in skiing, and we were all part of that and living that. And so as a senior project at the University of Buffalo, New York, years later, I decided to design a ski that was like a snowboard, because for me, I always loved skiing. I just couldn't do enough on my skis, and I could do so much more on my snowboard. I thought, why can't I combine the best assets of a snowboard into a ski? And so you can see that drawing right there is what I did as a senior project. And I basically took a snowboard and I cut the dimensions in half. So I made a ski, and this is the actual ski I made. It's half the width of a snowboard, half the length. It's twin tip, just like a snowboard, so you can go forwards and backwards. It was smaller, so you can spin easier. It was symmetric, it had deep side cut, it had all these attributes that were common on a snowboard that did not exist on a ski. And that spring, by the time school was done here, um, I had made one, made this, and I did it by cutting wood into the shape of the ski. I pumped hot water out, off of my parents' uh, Coleman stove, ran it through copper pipes, I learned to solder, and uh, put it under a car jack so I can press it into the shape. And by the end of that semester, I went to the hill, and in that one day, I could do so much more on this ski than I ever could on the traditional skis that had been you know, sold at that time. And so after graduation, I thought, you know, I got to do something with this because obviously if there was a ski in a store at that time, I would have just gone and bought it if there was a twin tip ski like you see now, but there wasn't. So I moved home to my parents' house. It's in Albany, New York, and that's a one-car garage. And in that garage, there's a little room in there, and that's where I started making skis. And so what I, I called the company Line, like a line you take when you're skiing down the hill. And that's my press. I made it out of uh, scrap steel. I learned how to weld. And I spent morning to night, I'd literally wake up, have breakfast, a bowl of cereal in the kitchen, go out to the garage and work all day from 7 in the morning to 11 at night. I didn't talk to my friends. I lost touch with everyone. I was just on this relentless mission to create the, not only a product and develop the product, but also you know, be able to have something on my own that I can ride and do that I never could previously do on the skis and share that with others. So I spent every day, seven days a week doing this. And by the end of that summer, you know, after taking over my parents' basement, there's a photo, it was their basement, now it's a wood shop. Um, we went on the snow and we were blown away at what was possible. There's my friend, Mike Nick. He was a friend of mine in high school and you could see him, he's doing a misty flip. That's a front flip with a 180 grabbing a ski. I mean, this trick is still done in the X Games, and this is 1995. 
I mean, this is a decade ahead of its time. And the only reason we were able to do that is because the product was so different. You could see the skis stuck in the snow that our friends had were still this style. And then here's me at Stratton Mountain hitting a gap jump in the park. And at that time, skiers weren't even allowed in the terrain parks. They weren't even called terrain parks. They were called snowboard parks only for snowboarders because anyone riding this had no reason to go in the park. So here we are literally getting kicked out of the parks. Snowboarders are throwing snowballs at us. And I'm thinking, dude, I was just in the park two hours ago on my snowboard. Why can't I go in here on my skis? Especially now that I have skis that, that can handle riding it. So you see the sign, snowboarders only. Skiers will lose their pass. So the next mission was to sell this product. So by the time that winter was over, I had evolved it a bit further into a product like this. And there's my friend on the left, Jeff, Karen. He was making my bindings. There I am on the right. We go to a trade show in Las Vegas where you sell skis to ski shops. And we had a little 10 by 10 booth there. I mean, I had no money to my name. My uncle gave me his flyer miles to fly out there and to get a hotel. Um, and we spent those four days, you know, thinking we're going to get a ton of orders. People are going to love this. Well, we might have talked to three people the whole show. This is four days. And snowboarding, on the other hand, was blowing up. There was literally hundreds of snowboard companies. I mean, this was just so on the rise. Everyone and their buddy had a garage somewhere building these microbrew type snowboards. And skiing was really mellow, really boring. And um, at the end of the show, I went home, you know, kind of down and out about the results. And um, a couple weeks later, I got a phone call from a local photocopy store, office supply store, and they said, hey, we have a fax from you, for, for you. So I drive to the store, and it's an order from a Japanese distributor for a thousand pair. Now, at the time, it took me a full day to make one pair of skis. I didn't have a thousand days to make this, okay? They needed it that winter. And so all, everyone I knew was like, man, that's a huge problem. What are you going to do? Oh my God, like, th this is crazy. And I thought, this is the best problem I could ever have. Because now someone actually wants this. So what would you do? I moved out of the garage, loaded my stuff on my friend's trailer, hired my friends from high school, anyone that was willing to work for me that summer. And we went ahead and made the skis. And there I am. I doubled up my press now. It makes two at a time. And I spent seven days a week building these skis. I was on a mission to make a thousand pair. If my dad had a day off, he'd come in and make them. If someone stopped by to say hi, before you knew it, they were making skis for me. So by the end of that summer, sure enough, we actually delivered a thousand pair. So the next year, we go to the trade show again, same trade show, and all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of other people making these. And the biggest on the far left is Solomon. They called it a snowblade. Now, we were calling this a ski board because no one could accept it as a ski, and it certainly wasn't a snowboard, and we had nothing left to name it. Solomon calls it a snowblade, and they've got resources that I never had. So they were able to get this product into every store, not only the country, but the world. So they're selling skis already. They tell the shop, hey, take 10 of these. They've got demos at every mountain, so they're getting skiers on it. And they're spreading the awareness in a way that I never could. Back home in the US, I still was only selling a handful of skis. So not only were they getting the awareness out, but they were also a sponsor of the X Games at the time. And the X Games didn't have skiing back then. It only had snowboarding. They convinced the X Games to put this form of skiing in it as a slope style event. Slope styles where you hit jumps, hit rails, going down the hill. Common today, back then, this was the first time skiing had ever been in this type of event. So we go there, the guy in the middle, that's my friend Mike, he gets the gold medal, I get the bronze medal. So after that, things just blew up. I mean, Newsweek magazine, I couldn't pay to get in that right now. They're writing a story about me making these skis. Um, New York Magazine, this is a trade magazine, how to capitalize on ski boarding, little goes big. Um, chairman of the boards, Mike's the athlete, Jay's the inventor. Uh, outfitter, that's a photo of me on the cover of a magazine. Now look at the background, there's no skiers. That's a half pipe before anyone skied in the half pipe. I was one of the only guys there and they're doing stories. And the highlight of this whole thing, New York Times Magazine. When that hit, that was big. And it says, manufacturing the next extreme sport, how ski boarding became the new snowboarding. So already five years into this, everyone is so hungry for this declining sport, this boring sport of skiing to have a new life, to be rejuvenated. And they're all pointing to this new twin tip ski coming from really snowboarding uh, to do it for them. So we're 
now finally getting orders in the US, not only Japan. We're building 4,000 pair a year, which is crazy. I mean, we're a bunch of 25 year olds, you know, with no knowledge of just, just going crazy all week, building skis. We got a half pipe out back. We're living the dream. But the reality is, this is 1999, I'm 26 years old, I owed banks $300,000. I owed credit cards $40,000, and I owed my mom 20 grand. I have $1,500 in my bank account, okay? So this is the difference between what you see on the outside of a company as a consumer and the realities of starting up. And this is five years into it. So what would you do? So <laughs> I go for it because I approach business the same as I do skiing. And if I want to land a big jump, I'm going to drop in with as much speed as possible. Because if I do, I have the best chance of landing it. And that's what I did here. So I go back to the trade show um, that year, SAA, in Las Vegas. And I sell skis like I'm the most successful company there. And people are patting us on the back, congratulations, you guys are kicking butt, you're doing great. And my mission really was to get an investor. And a few weeks after that trade show ended, I did. I got someone to buy a majority share of my company. I really didn't make any money out of it, but they paid off all that debt and we were able to move forward. They had much more resources than me. We moved out of the bigger garage now, out of the warehouse, and we started making these longer skis, basically a longer version of the same thing, which I always wanted to do, but never really had the resources. And so there's Eric Pollard, well-known skier today, no poles, you know, doing a 180. There I am taking video of him. I mean, this kid's way ahead of his time. Um, Chris Osna, Skogan Sprang, these are the leaders of the new school of skiing at that time. These guys were the most progressive, most innovative skiers, and they were leaving big money contracts from their ski sponsors to come ride for little me, just because I had a ski that actually was full twin tip. There were other companies making little tails and whatnot, modifying their race skis like this, putting a tail on the end, but this was legitimate. This is a lot closer to what you buy today in a store than anything that existed at the time. So they wanted the product that enabled them to do so much more. And you can see that photo on the cover of Powder Magazine. That was the first photo of someone on a twin tip ski in the air. And you can see that little glimmer of light on the tail. And that alone, shot us to the moon. Everyone recognized who are these guys, you know, look at what they're doing, and they've got the best athletes in the game, athlete-owned brand. And from there, you know, we could only go so far. We are on fire. Yeah, we had a new investor, but five years into that, by 2006, you know, 8,000 pairs of skis a year sounds good, but it's not enough. It's not enough to run a sustainable business. These other big ski companies I learned by that time were making 100,000 skis a year. So we kind of waved the white flag and said, you know what, we got a great brand here. We've got a, lot, a bit of debt now, again. We've got a great product. We know this thing will go, but we need the help of a big ski company. And that's the year that I sold it to K2 Sports. Again, believe it or not, I didn't make any money on this. I was never in it for the money. I was always in it for the good of the sport. But my baby moved on, it lived on, and I took a full-time job for that company running line skis for the next six years and grew it up to becoming the number five ski company in the US by 2012. I couldn't have been prouder at that time about what was accomplished and stoked that everyone around me is now understands what I was going for. They're all a part of it. Skiing has been completely rejuvenated since then. And if you, the amazing thing is if you look at the product, I mean, this is what I was making back then. This is what I made this year. And that crazy ski that everyone thought was, you know, really no point at that first trade show is closer to what exists now than anything that existed back in the day. And so if there's one thing you take away, one thing I've learned is nobody needs more of the same thing you absolutely have to think different. And that goes for everything in life. The other thing is, do what you love. Whether it's school or work, if you do what you love, you're gonna enjoy it, and if you enjoy it, you're gonna be the best at it, and you'll never feel like you worked a day in your life. Now that was a super short version of a two decades worth of my story. If you wanna hear the longer version with all the trials and tribulations that go with it, and find out our new ski company, Jay, go to jayskis.com and check it out. Thanks for your time, guys.